The person that was supposed to be here is ill, so I'm replacing him with a different talk, which was a very last minute change. So I don't blame you if you now leave. Happy that you all showed up here. It's always scary as a speaker to you know, get a last, last minute session and then nobody's showing up. All right, I'll start. Um, I'm very loud or not? Is my voice very loud? It sounds very loud. Okay, yeah, I need to keep you awake because some of you actually went to the uh, opening dinner, maybe had a couple of beers too much. I didn't. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about test-driven development. Um, who is, uh, like, is everybody here .NET developers? Like, just raise your hands, like a couple of them. Okay, so, oh, the rest is doing something else. Managers, maybe? Architects, something like that. Um, I'm going to share with you, and I'm really bad at counting. I stopped counting. I think it's more than 25. My tips and tricks after 15 years of practicing test-driven development. I'm also the author of uh, a little library, maybe you've heard of that, Fluent Assertions, uh, which is, yeah, seems to be reasonably popular in the .NET space, uh, which came from that. Um, there's, interestingly enough, there's another talk uh, on TDD happening in the same, uh, same slot, where somebody's saying that you shouldn't use it or something like that. Well, it's interesting, because I have a slide about that. So, in my experience, if you go through, see, somebody just realized it's the wrong session. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> enjoy, <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> it's confusing. So, has everybody seen this before? The Gardner Hype Cycle. It's very cool. So, whenever somebody actually comes up with a new idea, learns a new trick, a new pattern, a new tool at a conference, for example, the first thing is you, you do is you become enthusiastic about it, provided that sounds cool. So you go back to the office, you start to talk to your colleagues, and they're like, meh, we don't need that. What problem does it solve? I don't need it. Oh, she's back. Cool. Awesome. Um, so then what happens at some point, you start to become a little bit more enthusiastic. You know, you start to, I don't know, do internal presentations, maybe write an internal blog post, maybe even go in the, you know, open, you go in the, in the community, you, you create a plural site training, you write a YouTube videos about it, you write blogs, you go on stage and talk about TDD and how awesome it is. Um, but then, somewhere at some point, you start to realize that, okay, I can actually do this wrong or I'm actually doing it wrong, or I'm running into the situation that every time I start to refactor my code, I have to rewrite my tests. You know what? I don't know if I can say that, but TDD sucks. You know, that, that's what happens. And then, and that's what they call the peak of inflated expectations. And then you slowly go down. You become more negative. You start to write blog posts about the dark side of TDD, or why you shouldn't practice test-driven development. And by the way, you can replace this with anything, microservices, JavaScript, or anything like that. Um, and you become so negative, you do plural site trainings about like uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and mostly the ugly of TDD. And that's what they call the thrall of disillusionment. You're so disappointed. You are so enthusiastic about this new thing, and now you realize it really is such a bad thing. We should never do that anymore. Um, I've been through this cycle many times before. But then, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You start to realize that every principle, practice, tool, or whatever thought, has pros and cons. You need to understand the context in which it applies. You need to understand what rules to follow, what rules not to follow, to not be dogmatic. And that's what they call the plateau of productivity. I mean, usually it starts with a bit of an alignment, you realize this, you know, and then at some point you become productive. I like to think, and I, will be pr I might be proven wrong today or the next couple of weeks, that I'm at the plateau of productivity when, when it comes to TDD. With everything else, no. So every time I, I put this in my face and I wonder, where am I with this? Am I really being productive? Do you recognize this? Just checking, like, yeah. Anybody right now in the throw of disillusionment? No, of course not. We're all on the plateau of productivity. So to help you get to that plateau of productivity uh, when it deals with TDD, I'm going to share you a couple of things. Oh, by the way, I forgot a couple of things uh, about myself. This is me. Um, Actually, it's already outdated. I'm in the .NET space for 27 years. I turned 50 this year. I started on the Commodore 64 when I was 11 or something like that. So I, I, I'm supposed to be nerd, but I'm, I'm in rejection. I don't think I am. Uh, and I help companies to improve the entire software development effort. I usually play the coding architect, try to do all kinds of principal practices, show people how to write clean code, stuff like that. I have a couple of things, uh, a blog. Uh, coding guidelines for the last 20 years, uh, a couple of open source libraries, uh, and, and of course, fluent assertions. Um, yeah, that's it. 
Um, if you want to win a one-year license for Rider, which is JetBrains uh, IDE, I love that tool, take a nice picture, say something nice about me. It can also be something very nasty, it's also cool, doesn't matter, on Twitter, uh, or Mastodon, or Blue Sky, or whatever is popular these days. Facebook? No. Probably for the old people only, yeah. Okay, design for testability, the first one. I have one hour, no clue, because uh, this is a slide deck. This is important. Nobody in their clear mind will start to create a test out of the blue, even though every, every book about test-driven development tells you that. You, you shall write a test before you write production code. It doesn't work like that. Nobody does that. You start with a process which is called thinking. And this is kind of the cycle. Everybody is supposed to think about, OK, what are the classes? What are the elements in there? What functional components exist? How do things relate to each other? Where do responsibility fit? How do things interact with each other? Whether you do that on a physical paper, or you do it on some kind of, I don't know, a, a, a whiteboard, or you discuss it with colleagues, or even better, you know, start coding a little bit. Try to create a couple of classes or functions or whatever language, because this is, this is universal, uh, universal, applicable to any language, by the way. C Sharp, TypeScript, JavaScript, it uh, doesn't matter, PHP. But you start to come up with these, these ideas, and, and this is how I work. I start to create some classes. I start to look at the APIs. I'm starting to think, like, OK, does this make sense? Why does this method suddenly have like four or five parameters? Am I not creating too much coupling? Or did I create the wrong unit here? Do I have to revisit that a little bit? And I play around with that. And then I might actually start creating a test. And then I go through the whole cycle. So you know, you write your first test, you generate the stubs, you make sure that your test fails for the right reason, um, you make sure the test becomes green, and then you have the whole red-green thing. You, may, you maybe have heard about that. But you don't refactor immediately, because refactoring is about identifying patterns and trying to solve those or ref refresh or refactor that pattern so that it actually reuses code. But you don't know that if you have not seen at least, I don't know, three different scenarios where the same implementation is used. I always say, it's, I think it's called the rule of three. Like, if things happen twice, you see the same code twice, it's probably coincidence. If it's three or more, that might be a pattern and that you should could be refactored. Because refactoring can also lead to coupling. Think about that. If you actually start to see, hey, these are three, I have three different implementations. They're exactly the same. Are they? Are they maybe the same right now? Maybe they change over time and they actually start to diverge trying to force yourself to keep it the same implementation, apply dry. I'm already going to screw up my slide deck now. Oh, sorry, I'm recorded. I have to be. I'm, um, I'm mixing up my slide decks. Um, you have to be careful about that, because over, over use of refactoring and dry leads to, over, uh, leads to coupling, which is something you want to avoid at all costs. So that's why I repeat a couple of times. Usually, I just copy paste some test cases, start to you know, implement them again, I look at the scenarios. And only then I'm going to look at, like, OK, are these test cases actually the same? Do they look the same? Is there something in the test case that I can refactor? That's the point where I do that. But I'm very conservative with that, because I've seen so many developers running into this situation. They create all kinds of base classes and helper methods just to keep those test, test methods very clean. And that's a good thing, but then they actually start to hide the wrong things, and we'll cover that later on. And then you start to refactor, and then the whole cycle happens over and over again. Obviously, this is not a waterfall process. It's an iterative process. It's creative. That's, that is what it's supposed to be like that. Make sense? OK. Well, and then we use the test to drive the design further. So this is a screenshot from a pull request that I'm working on for a year already on Fluent Assertions, where I'm actually was starting to implement a couple of test cases. And while doing that, I started to identify all kinds of additional scenarios. And I didn't want to waste time on implementing those scenarios, creating tests for that. I just wrote it down. So it has become kind of a breadcrumb. I haven't looked at this pull request for like six months because I've been busy with other things. I have a life, and I have to do presentations, and kits, and everything. But if I, if I read them, I literally haven't seen them in a while. I immediately recognize and remember, oh, yeah, it jogs my memory. It brings back all these complicated scenarios. So this is what I literally do. I put it in source code, check it in in my pull request. So it actually is available in my repo for later usage. But that, that's a pretty simple technique, because that's what you do. You use the test to drive the design. And that's what test-driven development is really about, driving your design using the tests.
That's the, the, cru the crucial element of that. I hope that, that resonates with you. The other thing is you should organize your code by capabilities or functional slices because that helps you identify um, natural seams in your architecture. This is a nice uh, a picture of a, a, what some people call virtual slice architecture. I basically have a couple of functional slices, and I treat them as separate boundaries within the system, which also means that aligns really well with everything else that I'm going to be talking about. Dependency inversion principle, anybody knows solid by heart? Oh, good. No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. <laughs> but the, the D in solid, and by the way, solid itself, the whole principle, if you go to YouTube, you'll find somebody saying solid sucks or the, the bad side of solid. Yeah, really, look it up. I'll, I promise it's true. But the D in solid stands for dependency inversion principle, which a lot of people confuse with dependency injection. Yes, dependency injection is a tool. Dependency inversion is actually a dependency, sorry, the dependency, dependency inversion principle is a, a way of thinking. So I don't know if you can see that all the way in the back. But we have this blue box, which we call order processing, which has a dependency on something, an abstraction called iStore orders, which has a couple of methods, query of t, uh, add of t, delete of t, which are very generic methods, right? And then there's an unhibernate repository or an anti-framework repository if you really want to pain yourself. Um, you see the dependency, right? And you see also the ordering. So it's almost like you have your domain layer. Maybe there's a presentation layer on top. And then at the bottom, you have the data layer. So who thinks the data layer is specific or generic? Who thinks it's generic, the data layer? Who thinks it's specific? Who doesn't have any thoughts right now is just waking up? <laughs> so OK, I'll explain it to you. The domain layer is very, uh, sorry, the data layer is very generic. It has all kinds of generic methods. It cannot make any assumptions about what happens on top of it because dependencies go downwards. It can only optimize for what actually happens at runtime. You cannot actually look at the data layer, look at the methods, and optimize it. You know, if you know about databases, you have stuff like clustered indexes, non-clustered indexes. You need to use that information to optimize behavior. Yes, you can use a profiler, but generally, the lower layers of your system are the most generic one, or what um, uh, Robert C. Martin in his book calls the lower, lower level abstractions. What the dependency version does, and by the way, the methods are also usually very generic. It starts with a single method, and then you add another a couple of parameters to it to make it, you know, to provide more support, and it becomes worse and worse and worse. Dependency inversion principle actually reverses that. Well, yeah, that's where the dependency of the reversion part comes from. So the big difference is, is now we have still we still have an abstraction here, but the abstraction is actually part and owned by the domain layer, hence the coloring. I don't know if, if you're colorblind, you can see the difference. But the top part is blue. So even though it looks the same, it's not. Because every method on abstraction is very concrete, very specific for that particular module, the order processing module. And now, what you'll see is the dependency will actually go upwards. So the lower level of your system, your data layer, takes a dependency on the higher level, which is a completely different thing. If you look at it from a codeless perspective, you're like, oh, what's the big deal here? But the, the, the idea, the, thing, the, the, the mindset behind that is really crucial. This it makes a big difference. This also reduces the need for uh, uh, complicated mocking strategies, because these methods are usually very simple, very, cl very clear, very well, well phrased, very focused. That is what makes a difference. So the dependency inversion principle is something that I absolutely encourage you to use all over the place. And, and if you want to talk about it later on, I'll be around the whole day or tomorrow as well. Um, as I said earlier, you have all these slices. And as I already mentioned, that they will, they will kind of become the natural seams in your system. This also helps applying dry at the right level. Dry, don't repeat yourself, right? Which I'm doing continuously in this talk, I know. But it's early. Um, so essentially, what you see here now is that we have, for example, a duplicate. Do I have? You know, I don't have animations here. Um, for example, a duplicated surface. You see them in every slice, because dry leads to coupling. Dry makes it also very hard to test things. What I'm doing here is actually saying, okay, you know what? I'm just duplicating all over the place. I don't care. Every slice for me is a is an internal seam in my system. I do not want coupling. You know, I want to control that. 
So I'm very careful to apply dry, and I make sure that I basically duplicate code across the modules, across these vertical slices. I see people wonder, like, but you're duplicating code. That means you have to fix bugs in three different places. I hear that all the time. That never happened to me. And I'm doing this job for 27 years. I'm not saying that that means anything, because I've only doing TDD for 15 years, but it never happens to me. Because what happens is that duplicated code is quite often much more simple than all this generic code that you put in your, your, I don't know, your common, your helpers, your infrastructure project. And that's the real thing here. If you make things simple, right, keep, keep, keep think, uh, what is it, keep, keep everything simple, stupid, or something, what was it, KISS? KISS, keep, keep it simple, stupid, of course. Um, I didn't have my coffee yet. That's here as well. If you just duplicate it, quite often th that duplicated code is much easier to understand, and so there's less chance of bugs. However, there's never one end of the scale or the other end of the scale. It's always in, in depends. There's always code that you do want to centralize, especially if it's complicated. And that's why you see, for instance, this blue bar at the bottom called, called, called where there's a centralized service. So I'm not dogmatic about it. But because of my own painful history, and I love legacy code bases. I have another talk about this next uh, this Friday, tomorrow at the same time, same room, by the way, without being shared with another speaker. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I forgot. See, that's what happens. Help me, I don't remember anymore. OK, it doesn't matter. We go on. So um, the other thing that almost everybody struggles with is finding the right scope of testing. So I'll show you something. There is something called, uh, I'll, I can even zoom in a little bit here. This is a piece of code. It's called the database manager and has a, has a method called ensure table exists. Right? And you pass in the table name, and what does it do? It ensures that the table exists. Very obvious. This is the implementation of that. I don't know if you can read this. This is a very is an ancient language, like it's called UML, Unified Modeling Language. It's very old. Only the people without hair or gray hair can uh, still read this. But it basically means that the database manager is the one that's in charge. But it delegates the responsibilities to, I, I don't know, iDatabase adapter, some kind of abstraction. And it has one implementation, the SQL database adapter. But because you have an adapter and you've read the design patterns book, uh, you know, you've all had it on your, your desk like a long time ago, um, you also need a factory for that because, yeah, you need something to create a concrete implementation of that abstraction. So now you have two abstractions. Uh, and of course, you need to have an implementation for that. So now my question is, what is the unit here? What's the unit? If you have to create tests for this piece of code because you haven't practiced TDD, what is the unit? Is it the database manager itself? And then you, I don't know, you need to probably create a mock implementation of the adapter. But yeah, since you also need the factory, you also need to create a mock implementation of the adapter factory. And then the mock imp implementation actually returns a mock of the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People recognize that. Isn't that stupid? Why? Now, so the question is, what does this database manager actually do? What does the implementation of database manager and sure table exist do, do? Just imagine. One line, adapter dot ensure table exist. So it's not doing anything. If you, if you test code like that, it's actually just, you know, you're testing whether it's passing parameters from one mock to the other. It doesn't make sense. So I'm testing this whole thing as one unit. Really, yeah. Completely makes sense to me. I hope it does for you as well. Now I explain this to you. So this is an example from a real life code base created by a software development. OK, people already falling asleep. Um, um, from a real life code base written by an architect with 20 years of experience. And I asked him, like, why do you need these adapters? He said, well, it's solid. It's clean code. You know, it's a design pattern. We need to practice design patterns. I said, no, we don't need to. So, so I asked him, like, OK, how many implementations of this factory do you have, or this adapter do you have? Uh, one. OK, and how many, expect, uh, how many implementations do you expect in time? Uh, one. <laughs> this happens, and I'm pretty sure you recognize this. This happens everywhere. That's so we're actually introducing unnecessary abstractions, and you don't need that. But my point really is, this is a unit, because everything else is an implementation detail. I have one more example. This one. Yeah, you don't have to be able to read it all the way in the back. 
But there's a lot of components here, a lot of classes here. This is, oh, I can actually zoom in a little bit. I don't know if you've used Fluent Assertions, but as a method that you can use, that can say, the way you can use to say, I want, this, I want to verify in my unit test that this event is equivalent to another object. In this case, an anonymous, uh, anonymous type with, a, with one property, which is a very powerful feature. And uh, because, yeah, uh, this object, in this case, it's called event. I have no clue what it is. can be anything. It can be a complicated object that has reference to other objects, contains lists and dictionaries and whatever else. So the implementation behind that, that's a part of the implementation. That's just a subset of the implementation. Who actually thinks that you should test this, all these individual classes separately? Of course, nobody is. OK, OK, good. You do it just to challenge me. I know that. So if I would have done this, because 13 years ago, I started with this method, this B equivalent 2, do you think it actually consisted out of this, all these classes? Of course not. Initially, it was a very simple implementation. It was just one method with a couple of lines of code. And then over time, I added more capabilities to it, and that code became bigger. What do you do when the code becomes more difficult to maintain? Refactor. Did it change my tests? No because I was actually using the B equivalent method, which was the real one that really, that really important. Everything else was just you know, how I re refactored it and re-implemented it. Are we, am I using design patterns? Yes, I am. But that's because I use despite design patterns as a way to explain to people what kind of design to expect, which is the only value of design patterns. It's just a name. If I tell you I'm using the strategy pattern, I suppose that everybody knows, kind of has a feeling what it means. If I say it's a singleton, everybody knows what it is. That's the value of design patterns. Everything else is not important. So I'm saying that this whole thing for me is one unit because there's no reason why I would ever want to test this individually. In fact, if I would have done that, I would have to rewrite all my tests every time I refactored something. And that is bad because that's what, people, what makes people actually hate TDD because they keep re rewriting their tests. So that's your smell. If you recognize yourself and see that you have to rewrite your test every time, that is the signal that you may be doing it wrong, or at least there's room for improvement. Because again, it's no, there's no black and white. Sometimes you have to test smaller. Now, what is cool about this whole functional slice that I talked about is that it actually also creates not only a natural seam for applying dry, but also becomes almost a natural candidate for unit testing. So I actually treat uh, individual slices for like this. This could be an entire unit. HTTP request coming in, connecting with the database, applying all the domain logic, that could be a unit. I've, I've done that, and that works really well. Um, the same with the other slice. And then maybe within that, there's a service that I would test separately because it's a small, reusable piece of component within that scope that I actually want to test separately. Um, another service here or this slice here as well, and of course, the stuff at the bottom, which is really supposed to be generic and pr probably compl complicated, I also tested separately. This works really well. This is just this changed. When I started doing this, it completely changed the way I look at TDD and the design and everything. So I treat everything now. I start to organize everything in a, in a functional way. Don't worry if it, it doesn't get, if it doesn't, it doesn't click with you yet, it will, hopefully. And otherwise, you can blame me. So align your test scope with that. But sometimes it's also completely OK to test a little bit smaller. That's, that, it's always happening. Again, don't be dogmatic. Use it as a heuristic. Test bigger, you know, align it with your architectural slices, with your internal boundaries. But don't, don't worry that you sometimes have to test smaller. Like here, this critical component, which is inside a functional slice. I might even test the individual parts. That's completely OK. Sometimes you have to do that. So the rule of thumb here is that things that are reusable should be tested separately. No, correction. Things that are designed to be reusable should be tested separately. Because everything is potentially reusable. But then generally, the whole idea of reusable code, I think it's kind of flawed. It's very difficult to reach that point. So if you actually intended this piece of code or this a group of classes to be reusable, test it separately. Otherwise. Treat it as an implementation detail of a bigger scope. Everybody's thinking like, OK, wait a second, yes. Now, that also means that if, for example, organize your code in a functional structure, 
that the folders which are side by side, adjacent of each other, you should also see them as separate boundaries. So is anybody using ASP.NET? A couple of people. Uh, do you have your folder structures like views, controllers, repositories, that kind of stuff? Who has that? Yeah. Um, it's probably not because you did that, but because Microsoft actually did that by default. I think that's wrong. Because if you look at that code, if I'm actually, I have no experience with your code base, if I'm going into that code base, I see folders like views, controllers, I don't know, repositories, uh, view models, whatever pattern you use. And then I'm wondering, OK, but what belongs together? Which view belongs to which view model? Because there's usually some kind of one-to-one -one correlation, but it's not obvious from the code base. So if there's no unit testing, yeah, very low code coverage, and I have to introduce unit testing, I'm like, yeah, but wait a second. This is in a different folder. I cannot actually assume that this view model is always used by this view. So you know what? I'm actually going to use abstractions and a mocking, and you find these I interfaces all over the place. That's a signal because you structured your code in a technical way, and that never leads to the right solution. So always group things together. It makes everything so much easier. People will understand your code base much easier. Again, I'm repeating myself, which I shouldn't, is you can align hey, dry with that. Your unit testing scope, all of that becomes completely obvious to you. I don't know if you've heard about the term uh, the screaming architecture, which literally means you look at code bases and you immediately see the architecture behind that. That is what you want to achieve. I'm not saying that's simple, because otherwise I wouldn't be a consultant, but still. What else? Well, um, another example. Um, ASP.NET, if you build an HTTP endpoint, I don't call it the REST API because it's going to lead to a necessary debate, but it's an HTTP API. Uh, in .NET, you do that using a controller, or <coughs> if you're really fancy with a slightly different structure with minimal APIs, but in principle, there's a controller. That controller has a method, usually the name of the method, and there's some attributes on top of it. Um, if you create tests for that, what do you do? Well, it's class. You create an instance of that class, like here. And you can see that, it's pretty small, but you have controller.getCounts per state with a country code. <coughs> so you literally create uh, here, a, 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 oh, it well, doesn't work like that. It's too far away. Cheap, cheap uh, AliExpress thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm back. So what a lot of people have seen doing it is you literally create an instance of the controller class and then call the, the method on it just from a unit test. But then I wonder, like, but wait a second. A controller is just an implementation detail. If you're adopting newer versions of .NET, you might actually want to adopt minimal API or use something else. In the past, we had other open source libraries for that, like Nancy. Those are implementation details. What is the only entry point in that piece of code? The HTTP request. So you really want to send an HTTP request to your, I don't know, component, let's call it like that, including headers about you know, what kind of serialization you expect. And what you expect back is headers about you know, HTTP codes, like is it a bad request? If it's a 200, OK, maybe it returns caching headers. That is the real service header area. And that is what you should be testing. Unfortunately, I suppose most people are somewhere in the .NET space. That is trivial. In .NET, it's pretty easy to create an entire application, including the HTTP server, run it in process without, without touching a network layer, and you can send an HTTP request. That's what you should do. I have plenty of examples on my, open, on the, on the, on my uh, GitHub repos, if you're interested. But I'm literally say, calling get async with the full URL, because that's part of the contract. That is the service area. The URL, the query parameters, that's all part. That's what you're actually doing here. So that's what you want to see. That's important. Don't go through a backdoor into the database, for example. Don't do that. Use the service area. <coughs> the slides will be on the internet. And, and uh, I kind of alluded to that earlier, it's completely fine to include the database in your tests. You can even call them unit tests, because you made a conscious decision, or I did, that my unit is a little bit bigger, but it's still a unit. And I, but wait a second, a database, isn't that an integration test? It's slow. No, because it's 2023, almost 2024. We can now create, as part of our unit tests, create a Docker container running Linux and SQL Server if you want to, and it will be lightning fast, completely independent of other tests, will not cause any side effects. It complies to all the traditional you know, rules of what a unit test should entail. It just works. 
It's beautiful. This is an example of, I think it's called test containers for .NET. I think actually it is. And it will just spin up a container at the beginning of a set of tests, execute your test in order, sequentially in the end, clean it up. And if you use something more modern like, uh, I don't know, RavenDB or MongoDB, they all have in-memory implementations which are 100% compliant with the production environment. That's what I would use. Makes everything so easy. The example with the database manager that I showed you earlier where the person was actually testing mocks, interaction with mocks, perfect because the only value, or sorry, the only responsibility, thinking about the single responsibility principle, of the database manager is, no, nobody? To manage the database? So yeah, then your test should also deal with the database, because what else are you testing then? Well, this is a, a more simple example. Uh, you do want to make it clear what's the range part, you know, the entry criteria, what's the act, what is the test actually doing, what method is it exercising, or what ATP request is sending, and what is it asserting. asserting. So I typically use this arrange, act, assert everywhere. You wonder if your tests are really clean, do you need that? Yeah, probably not, but this is some of the areas where I'm a little bit dogmatic because I notice that it helps younger people understand what's happening. Um, but sometimes it's also totally okay to adopt a more BDD style test. It is not behavior-driven development as it was initially meant to because that involves uh, business people, which are typically not involved in writing automated tests at this level. But this is an example of using chill. You don't need to be able to read everything. You can look it up later on. But where I'm actually using a different style, because the, 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 the piece of code or the, the, the component that I'm testing is actually much more orchestrational by nature. It interacts with all kinds of different components. And I really want to test that interaction between that. And sometimes, or oftentimes, it's actually I'm doing one act, but that act triggers multiple different operations, interactions with other parts of the system. In that case, a more BDD-style testing is, is better, or can be better. Again, it's an option. Uh, what else? Yeah, I already alluded to that as well. Don't bother trying to identify or define what a unit integration test. I did, because I thought, like, oh, this, this miscommunication. I need to write it down on Confluence. You know, try to define this. Uh, what is a unit test? It doesn't matter. You know, I, uh, I had a colleague that, uh, that kind of called it, I think it was called an appropriately sized test. It doesn't, you know, come out of that that smoothly. So I just call them automated tests. It's just a test. It doesn't matter whether it's a unit integration. It matters that you thought about the scope of that test. And it also matters that you understand that there's different levels of testing. You have small scopes, you have bigger scopes, you have UI tests, you know, you, you remember the, the pyramid, this, this still applies. I'm not challenging any of that. I'm just saying, don't bother about the term. It's just testing. Some, some guidelines, well, write your test like you write your production code, assuming that you actually write production code that you care about. So the same thing applies, naming, documentation, if you, want, if you do that, uh, using all kinds of analyzers like editor config for code layouts or Rosalind analyzers to, to make sure you don't make stupid mistakes. That applies to test code as well. It is first class citizen. In fact, if you practice TDD, it's very likely that at least 50% of your entire code base is test, test code. That's quite normal. And your manager will say, but isn't that a waste of time? Yeah, try to put something in production without tests. If for me, it's like driving without seatbelt. I don't know if it's common in Portugal, but in the Netherlands, it's not. Well, it's not supposed to be. It's, it's real, really uncomfortable if I have to deal with a code base without tests. And this is, by the way, what I'm talking about, what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow at the same slot, because I've dealt with a lot of legacy code. Uh, by the way, legacy code is also stuff that I wrote last week, just for the record. And the same that you wrote. This is the ultimate promise of TDD, that you can actually use your tests as documentation. I believe it's true, all of it. Like if I use it, look at my own open source project, Fluent Assertion, uh, we have like 97% code coverage. It's very high, unrealistically high. But it's because all these contributors love to increase the code coverage, and we use mutation testing and stuff like that. But the point is, every test that I wrote, that I wrote, that I wrote myself, I treat that as an example of how you can use the library. So quite often, if I get questions on Stack Overflow, well, not anymore because Stack Overflow is not used. Now we have AI. But if I get questions, um, I hope I didn't insult anybody that works at Stack Overflow. But um, Oh, yeah. Uh, so quite often I get questions over Slack, over email, on Twitter or something. 
I quite often, the first thing as I do is go to the examples to see, okay, how can I actually do that? What was the, the API that I supported for that? And then I send them a link to the particular test case because that is actually the best explanation of how the thing is supposed to work. Also, when I get a pull request to review, generally also in my projects, the first thing as I do is actually go to the tests to try to understand, okay, what is the scope? What is this thing supposed to do? What are the semantics? What kind of behavior is it supposed to expose? Because that helps me understand what's happening and also identifies, it helps me identify missing scenarios. Hey, did you actually think of when, what happens if you call this method before that other method? Is that valid? You know, or if it's an HTTP request, are you actually returning the right um, HTTP, HTTP error code? Like if I sent you a message that is technically correct, it's just functionally at that point in the wrong state, do you send me a bad request? Or do I get something like belt, like what is it, 207 conflict or something like that? That is what I think about. I treat them as documentation. And you should do as well. Also, I don't know if you're in the .NET space, but it's, there seems to be some kind of common thing where you take a class and then create an interface behind that, put an eye in front of it for everything. That is weird. You can totally inject concrete classes. That is completely normal. Every dependency injection framework supports that. You don't need interfaces. In fact, I would say that if you introduce interface like that, you might be on the wrong path. You might not think again hard enough about what is your internal boundary. Yeah, but I need to be able to create mocks out of that. No, you don't. If you start to create a little bit of bigger scope and understand that things belong together, half of the time you don't need mocks and you don't need that interface. It's unnecessary abstractions. Unless you use role-based interfaces, which is a different thing, which, by the way, is the I in solid. Interface segregation pattern. No? Yes. No? Oh, now I've lost myself. Yes. The inter interface segregation principle. It's separating interfaces so they represent what they're supposed to do, not what, what the implementation is behind that. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that mocking is bad. No, mocking is very useful, but within boundaries. So you see here, for example, that between the two left slices, you can totally use mocking because they're different boundaries and you don't want to create coupling between them. So between those, you do have interfaces or abstractions or some other way of decoupling. The same here between the other slices. And maybe here as well between the shared services, they probably have an interface. Um, but inside, no, you don't need to. If you test bigger, you don't need mocking. And what's even worse, and I already mentioned it earlier, don't return mocks for mocks. If you do that, and again, it's not always bad, but it's always bad, so don't do that. If you see that, you start to wonder yourself, like, what does this dude at the NDC in Porto mention? Something about mocking and not using mocking and stuff like that. And again, I'm not saying these are not rules, by the way. Uh, this is just a risk. I want you, I would like that you start to think about this thing. If you didn't already do that and completely agree with me, that would be perfect, of course. Um, this is one of the most important rules that I follow or principles that I follow when I write tests. Hide things that are not important for that specific test. Okay. So, for example, I have... Uh, I use the test data builder a lot. So if you build HTTP tests, tests that actually interact with an HTTP pipeline, so you're going to send HTTP requests, there's usually quite some plumbing needed to spin up the HTTP server in .NET, you know, create the builder, use the web builder, uh, register all the, the services. There's quite a lot of noise. That noise is not important for the test, right? Except if you have a test that is actually about making sure that all the dependencies have been registered correctly. But most of the other tests, you don't want that. In that case, using something like a test data builder that will do that for you is a very nice way of doing it. So in this case, in my test, I just say, I want to have a test host builder, and it needs to be using my document store, which is some kind of NoSQL solution, and I'm using event sourcing, so it's using event store, and I have a couple of ASP.NET Core modules that need to be registered. I don't care for that particular test how that happens. I just need it to be set up in, as, in little, as little lines as possible without hiding details. And that's an important rule. So things which are not important for that particular test case, you should try to hide. If it's needed in the next test case, you actually should show it. And that's also why I said it earlier, be very careful with refactoring tests 
be very careful with applying dry in your test cases. Every test case should be self-sufficient, should explain the cause and effect, and hide everything else. Oh, and also the opposite is also true because it also means that the things that are important, like the route that you sent an HTTP request to, needs to be shown because that's important. If for that test it's important to know that I'm actually sending, I don't know, an e tag because I'm verifying that my HTTP response is actually taken into account caching, then I want to show that. It needs to be clear. Don't hide it in a base class or something. You know what's the worst thing? Is when people create a base class for all their unit tests and then realize that, oh crap, now I have a couple of tests that need a slightly different behavior. You know what? I'll make some method on my base class virtual. Override it. I see people shaking their head. It means it's a good thing that you shouldn't be doing that. I've seen it myself. I've done that. You know what's worse? Multiple levels of base classes. That's even worse. So you don't have to be embarrassed if you do that. I've done that. Uh, and sometimes it's OK. Sometimes it actually solves the problem. If you're building these complicated end-to-end -end test cases, like I do for the functional slices, you're inevitably going to build some kind of little framework around that, and then it becomes, it becomes useful to have something like that. But again, that rule is, is going to remain there. You always have to follow the rule. In Germany, <coughs> there's, um, there's an artist from the 90s, was very popular. I'm pretty sure you don't know him. He's called Scooter. Uh, yes, OK, yeah, so, so people are old enough. And um, there was a, he has a, has, a, has a phrase somewhere in his song called, it's nice to be important, it's more important to be nice. And because of that, my colleagues actually call this the scooter rule, because it's about the point. I don't know, it's probably not even funny, but uh, unless you know the song. Play hyper hyper, you remember, then I know what I'm talking about. Well, I think this was mentioned already at another conference session this week. Ensure that it fills for the right reason. Make sure that if you create a test, especially if, you, if you're solving a bug, First, create a test case to make sure that you can reproduce the bug. Make sure it fails, but also make sure it fails for the right reason. Does it actually give you the response data or the, uh, the result or actually uh, throw the right type of exception with the right type of message, exception message, that you're expecting before you start implementing it? It's even what I'm so um, sometimes so wa wondering about this that even if I fix the bug and the test is green, I sometimes just undo the change to make sure the test still fills, which is very useful because you would not be the first one to fix a bug, put it in production, or you know, create a pull request. The QA engineer starts testing it. It's still broken. But what? My unit test is green, right? That happens. Other thing is, like, you know, we've all been trained you know, with, with, with whips and everything that you should not use magic numbers, right? Actually, I'm saying that in your unit test or your automated test, you should use magic numbers. And you should use magic strings and everything else. Because defining all these cons at the top of your test is not going to help your test understand. You know, if you have a number like, I don't know, one, two, three, do you just use one, two, three in your test cases? It's much easier to read and have some cons in front of that. It's for everything. I quite often use things like um, the client or a company, or some company, if I use strings for that, to emphasize the, the, um, the significance of that value. But I don't define const for that, because a const is another line of code that makes it more difficult to read my tests. Exception, of course, is a GUID, because I'm pretty sure you're not very good at understanding whether the GUID is correct. Are you? OK. Right. Oh, yeah, you have an example. Country code, document number, kind state, versus just using it there. Document one, two, three. It's completely readable. If you can't see the cause and effect that in a couple of lines of code, then something is wrong. You need probably need to get some classes. Again, this is what I do. It doesn't mean you have to do it. Um, the other thing is that oh, the other thing is that if you, for example, have an HTTP request uh, or something else that returns JSON. What quite often happens is people then, like in your production code, you probably have some kind of type that you've configured to be able to serialize to JSON, right? Maybe it's a record, maybe it's a class, maybe it's something else. What you shouldn't do is then take the same class and use it in your test to deserialize to. But wait, why? That's very nice because then if I change my class, you know, my test won't break. That makes it very refactorable. Yes, that is true. But the thing is, if you change 
you add a new property to that class that you use in your, I don't know, ASP.NET controller, you're actually changing the contract. And what is your test supposed to do? Make sure that you don't break your contract. So don't do that. Changing the implementation, uh, if that ch implementation affects the way your API responds or the, the data that returns back, is a breaking change. You need to make that explicit. So I never do that. And that's one of the reasons why I initially wrote this B equivalent 2. In this example, I actually wrote a specialized version of B equivalent 2 um, that would take an object, sorry, it takes a JSON response, an HTTP response, serial, deserializes into an anonymous type where I only specify the properties that are relevant for my test, and then verify them against this. So here you see this is not the best example because I'm actually using it. I don't have a picture. Yes, you have a picture. So this response object is an HTTP response message. And I'm saying it should be equivalent to a collection or an array that contains one object which has two properties. Everything else is relevant. And this be equivalent to will then deserialize whatever is in the response message into an anonymous type with that structure, ignores all the other data because it's not relevant, and then compare it with that. So if the JSON actually returns lowercase, uh, like Pascal case properties, I should use Pascal case here as well. <coughs> I'm literally asserting, asserting that what, is com what comes back matches my expectation without using production code. If somebody changed the implementation, this test will break, and it should break. All right. Well, this is, uh, of course, what you get if you, do pract if you practice TDD correctly. If you have test cases that are self-describing, that actually uh, fill with really clear messages, like that's what I, why I created fluid assertions, it should keep you at the debugger hell. That's what you try to do. So in this case, it will say something like expected property counters index zero dot state to be closed, but active differs new near act index zero. In a newer version, we even in introduce like things like arrows so that you see where is the mismatch, because that's what you want. Especially if you like long phrases, I don't want to copy paste those uh, the, the the expectation and the and the result into a diff view or something like that. If you need to do that, that's already a signal that you can improve yourself here. Ideally, it keeps you out of the debugger hell. So, uh, in terms of naming an organization, I actually am uh, postfix all my test files with specs, not tests, specs. Why? It's just a stupid uh, practice because I like to emphasize the fact that my test cases are actually specifying the behavior of my tests. Some of my colleagues are like, why are you so being so dramatic about this? So if, you, if you challenge this, then I wonder if you're actually practicing TDD in the way it's supposed to happen. You're designing the behavior of your system, then these are specs. Stupid little thing. I'd also group test by API or, con or concept or capability. Because if you have, like, uh, especially in code base like fluent assertions, there's a lot of test cases. We have 6,500 test cases because there's a lot of functionality in there. But there's lots of different variations of those tasks. And then they become very long. And how do you differentiate? You get very long test names. So I sometimes start to group them, like member hiding, you see it on the top, uh, including, excluding properties, accessibility, uh, which makes my, allows me to create much smaller naming uh, test names. And I have another example of that. I actually use fact-based names. Like, why is it duplicate? OK. Like, um, respecting the runtime type includes both properties and fields. Not, I used to do, when this and this happens, it should happen that, like that. I love that, because I like, I like my test to be functionally named. But over the years, I realized that there's actually a lot of noise. There was a blog post I wrote about that, uh, that I read about that, that actually changed my mind. So now I use fact-based. I try to state. What is the expected behavior? Like, what should it do? And that's quite hard, by the way, but it makes your test much easier to read. Because if you don't, and you have like um, an overview of all the methods in your test file, they probably all start with the same piece of text. That doesn't really help. I want to, you know, if you use Rider, you have this um, structure window that shows you an overview of your file with all the names and everything. I use that a lot to scan through the test names, especially when I'm reviewing code to see, okay, what are the different scenarios? If everything starts when querying the database underscore, when querying the end database underscore, when querying the database, that doesn't really help unless you have a wide screen. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So that, that's a tick. You can actually see some examples from the code base. So I'm done. Um, 
I think I shared a lot of things. There are definitely more than 25. I think there were 35 or something. At least I hope I made you think. You know, when you go back to work next Monday, you start to rethink or maybe challenge some of the things you've been doing. If you have questions, if you, if you run into issues, you can reach me here uh, on the different channels. Uh, there's also uh, Fluent Assertion Slack, which I use to ask, answer all kinds of TDD-related things. You can also ask ChatGPT or AI Assistant, uh, but they will probably just recommend using my library. That's literally what happens, by the way. Um, and if you're interested in dealing with legacy code, tomorrow at the same room, same time, I'll also talk about that, all my pain and struggles and what you can learn from that. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.